Welcome back to the Financial Shepherd Podcast. My name is Joshua Casey Garland, Certified Financial Planning Professional, Founder and CEO of Shepherd Wealth Management. Very excited to be back here in uh, studios today for today's podcast. We've got all kinds of news happening. Um, we're doing this a little different today. We have a completely different format. Thanks to uh, the man behind the camera for, I don't know, two years now, Ez. Uh, welcome to the front side of the camera. Yeah, it feels good. It's, uh, I feel free. I feel <laughs> naked and free. I like it. I like it. Um, and of well, course, uh, here in the dark, you know, we chose our inaugural podcast day and the lights, uh, the lights burned out. So here we are. No, I love it, man, because you've been driving from Louisville um, for close to two years now, yeah. um, helping me do this podcast show you know, in person, which has been awesome. But I've made that drive from uh, where I live in Northern Kentucky to Louisville every day for a year. Now, you haven't had to do that every day. It's been more like a couple times a month, but it's still an hour and 20 minutes one way, and it's a lot. So I'm glad that we were able to figure this out virtually. Um, being able to stream this live on YouTube like we have been. Mm -hmm. But uh, this kind of opens things up. Now we can do a podcast pretty much anywhere, anytime, uh, from any location, as long as we have our equipment with us. Yeah, we can finally knock that fantasy out where we're both in a Disneyland and we're podcasting with each other. So <laughs> Exactly, exactly. So you're in your headquarters in Louisville. Uh, headquarters. For those that don't know a little bit about Ez, he is a, uh art savant, I guess is the best way to say it. Uh, graduate degree in uh, in this specific uh, subject. Um, just got back from Italy. Got to do a pretty cool stuff out there for some uh, some grant work. And uh, this is your studio. So I'm in my studio shooting a podcast. You're in your comfortable background studio. You got 3D printers and stuff. 3D printers. Um, got to feel comfortable, right? I do. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to stand up. So the you know we got business up top, but uh, we're definitely in lounge clothes on the bottom. So. No, I love it. So this is the man behind the camera. Um, done a great job for us. A uh, ton of great feedback about the podcast, the way it's produced and set up. Uh, so now we're going to be delivering this to you guys in a little bit different format. Um, we'll be upgrading kind of the, the background stuff and some of the nuances that go along with the podcast. But uh, that's all thanks to you, Ed. So really appreciate all the work and support. And uh, I'm glad that we're able to make this more convenient for you too, man. Me too. You know, happy to do it. You know, I love working with you and really love yeah, yeah. Uh, all the shepherd wolf and this, management. And this is great too, because this is my area of expertise, this topic of finance, the world of finance and investing, uh, wealth management, uh, retirement planning and taxes. That is not your world at all. No. <laughs> You've been you do this show and it's been awesome, but I'm glad that you get to do this in the comfort of your world, which I know absolutely nothing about. I took one art history class, by the way, as an elective. Um, when I was a sophomore in high, uh, college at the University of Kentucky. So I, I did get, uh, I'm sorry, I did get a, uh, a B plus in that class. I did not get an A. That's a um, higher grade it. than me. So <laughs> it was a lot of fun. But yeah, we're very excited. We got all kinds of news today. We got inflation news. Um, we have all kinds of information regarding earnings. Uh, we got a lot of data coming up here in the next couple of weeks. And of course, wanted to start the show, I guess. I was debating this literally up until the time we started this. So Charlie Munger, 99 years old, uh, recently passed away just yesterday um, in uh, Los Angeles, California hospital. Um, obviously, the significance here is he's the uh, vice chair of Berkshire Hathaway and Warren Buffett's right-hand man for 50 years running this company. Uh, one of the most successful companies in the history of capitalism. Um, and Charlie Munger played a massive role in that. Um, he was the yang to Buffett's uh, yang. Uh, Buffett, very smart, witty individual. Charlie Munger, very direct, straight to the point, kind of sharp tongue. Um, didn't really care what people thought about him. Buffett wanted to be loved. Charlie really didn't give a, you know what, um, he just wanted to tell you, you know, how it was. So um, obviously a ton of respect. We quote Warren Buffett all the time. We haven't quoted Charlie that much. Uh, so he's been uh, kind of the second man behind Buffett, if you will, for Berkshire Hathaway. But his uh, Berkshire would not be what it was or is uh, without Charlie Munger uh, being involved with that. And Buffett was the very first person to uh, make sure that everybody understands that. And he said that repeatedly, you know, for decades on end. So we'll talk a little bit about that today as well. Probably we'll uh, uh, maybe wrap up the show with that, if you will, because we got some other uh, data points to get to here. But uh, before we get into that, uh, we started talking uh, about Thanksgiving. Uh, I know we had a good one. I fried a turkey. It turned out perfect. Um, my wife did a phenomenal job of uh, nice. hosting everybody. Um, 
So I hope all of those that uh, got got together with family and friends had a good Thanksgiving, as I, I think you did. I didn't get to hear a lot of details about it because you were in Bowling Green, right? Is that right? Uh, no, it was actually in Frankfurt at an, at an aunt's house. Uh, Frankfurt, Kentucky, a little south of where your headquarters are, a little east of where I'm at here in Louisville. And uh, it was actually uh, an eventful holiday where my 12-pound dog tried to fight my aunt's 45-pound uh, Rhodesian Ridgeback. And uh, there was blood, so we had to cut out early. <laughs> All right. Well, at least it wasn't family on family. It was kind of a dog-on-dog -dog sort of uh, activity. Yeah, no yeah. money exchanged hands on the winter either, so no laws were broken. That's good. Yeah, let's yeah. Get ready. we need to clarify that. We're pro-animal. We are very pro-animal in this house. I don't okay. even eat animals. That's how pro I am. So. That's a, wow, that's true, too. Different, different subject, but uh, kind of similar. Um, so, yeah, gl glad everybody had a good holiday. Um, we got freaking December 1st is tomorrow, right? All right? Yeah, December 1st is tomorrow, man. That's unbelievable. Um, fastest year of my life, no doubt. I think and, for me uh, as well. I just can't believe we're a month away from Q1. Like that blows my mind. Yeah, I'm excited, about, I'm excited about that. And I appreciate you kind of taking me there, man, because this has been the year of haters, in my opinion. Um, I know we've written about this in uh, newsletters that I've, I've sent out. And by the way, uh, if you like the show, shepherdwm.com, uh, right at the top of the page on our website, it takes you right to all of our newsletters that we've written this year. Um, takes you to the blogs that we write almost every Friday. Um, also has links directly to our YouTube channel for all these podcasts. Um, in addition to that, you can check us out on Spotify as well. If you're you know, walking around the neighborhood, get some exercise, uh, you can listen to us uh, from there as well. But shepherdwm.com is where you can go to find all that. You can find out a whole bunch of information about the firm itself, Shepherd Wealth Management, uh, about myself and our uh, president of the company, John Ashcroft, business partner. Um, and the, uh, the cool thing about this show, the biggest feedback that we get and the thing that I enjoy the most about doing this, and I continue to remind the viewers and listeners because it might be the first time you guys are checking out the show, um, is that the news does a really good job of telling you whatever the headline is. And generally the headline is something to be worried about. Um, it's just the way the news, news uh, operates. And it's not something that I criticize them for. They're doing their job. They're informing you of something. That is relevant um and they're also there to sell ads so the more eyeballs they can get on their programs the more ads they can sell at a higher price that's how they make money there's nothing wrong with that i'm a capitalist and i will never um never bash them for doing that now the one thing that they don't do is tell the viewer to go do their own homework on the subject because generally speaking it's not the first time that we've gone through whatever it is that they're talking about whatever the headline news is is almost never the first time the only time that it's been true that it's the first time we've been through something that was a headline risk, if you will, was the great pandemic. We never shut down a global economy for you know over a year before. There's no playbook for that one. So I'll give you that. But outside of that, I think the news does an absolute terrible job of giving you historical precedent. They might say, yeah, you know, this is a 40 year high inflation, but what they do a terrible job of is say, oh yeah, this is something that we've been through multiple times as a country. Uh, here in the United States, and here's what the outcome was six, nine, 12 months later, you know, for, for investors or specific industries or for a global economy or whatever. And all that information is extremely important because human beings are, in fact, what makes up the market. And the great news about that is, is human beings are quite predictable, specifically over long periods of time. We haven't changed all that much in the last 2000 plus years. Um, so I look at history because Warren Buffett himself was famously quoted as saying the one thing that we know for sure about human beings is they do not learn from history. And if you know anything about Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, um, we'll talk about this more here in just a minute, but they literally block out big chunks of their day to just sit in a room and read and think, and then look at what history has to say about these events. This is how they control their temperament or their emotions um, so that they don't get too greedy when things are too good. Uh, so they don't get too fearful when all the headline news is nothing but the sky is falling. And that's exactly what happened here this year. So 2023 is the year of haters. I'm going to yeah, put that out yeah. there right now from an investment standpoint. Why? And you can again go to shepherdwm.com, check out our January newsletter. It pretty much sums it up. There's like 20 something banks, the biggest banks, everybody knows them. And um, all of them but three had a positive uh, performance on the S&P 500. Um, 
basically everybody was calling for the S&P under 4,000. It was an imminent recession was going to happen and um, inflation was going to continue to be a major problem. Well, here we are one day away from the last month of the year and the S&P 500 is up almost 20%. Here's the deal though. The outflows, money flows, right? Um, money flows for retail investors. Here we go. Here's my note. Retail flows into equities was negative $240 billion year over year. So going back one year from today, negative $240 billion left the equity markets wow. while the S&P 500 is up approximately 20%. So this just goes to show, if you look at the headline news, if you follow the biggest banks, your favorite person, first of all, you shouldn't just have one favorite person. Mine's Warren Buffett, right? But I read all kinds of other information as well. Um, if you just look at the headline news, you got this whole thing so wrong. That was a very expensive year. You guys might be sitting in cash, money markets getting whatever, close to 5% now. Uh, maybe you got 5% or better if you locked in something for a year, like a treasury, um, something around the 5% number. You might be saying, oh, I didn't lose money. Well, your opportunity cost was 15%. So take whatever value of money that you got multiply it by 1.15%. And that's what you should have had without hiring a professional at all. You could have bought the S&P 500, sat back on the couch or played golf or whatever it was that you did during this year, other than invest in the market, and you'd be significantly better off. Wow. That's why we do this show, folks, is because that was a very expensive lesson that hopefully you're going to learn from. But my guess is, unless you're open-minded enough, to understand that you might not be the best person to hire to manage your own money. I think about that for a second. If everybody was able or um, I, it'd be nice if it worked out this way where um, you could post your performance anonymously, like Joe in uh, Louisville, his pen name, Joe, right? Not really yeah. Joe, could be Ezra, right? And you're like, hey man, I got 5%. And everybody else in the same area was able to post their, their results under some sort of pen name. I would be willing to bet there's a lot of people that would, if they were logical enough to say, man, I should fire myself. Because if I were to post numbers like that, I wouldn't have a business. right? I, I just simply would not. And the fact of the matter is, I watch CNBC and all these other news channels like all the time because it's my job to get the data and go look at what history has to say about the data. Um, and then formulate some sort of asset allocation around that because the market's forward looking. It's not just going to sit there and stew upon whatever the headline news is that day. It's going to try to project out what that means for corporate profits over the next six, nine, 12 months. So that's why I like to look at history because it controls my temperament, gives me some sort of idea of where the ball might be going. That way I can build an allocation or rebalance the asset allocation for customers in a timely manner. Um, and I bet a lot of people out there are sitting back saying, well, I didn't lose money. Did you know? <laughs> really? <I> mean, <laughs> really? <laughs> you, you did. It was an expensive lesson to learn. No, no doubt about that. Um, so I just encourage every investor, um, if you're going to hire yourself to manage your portfolio, there's a lot more involved than just figuring out what stocks you want to own or what bonds you want to own. It has a lot to do with the weighting of all the positions themselves. And the one thing that Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger uh, preached for decades, I encourage you guys to go to YouTube and just um, you know, type in Buffett and Munger um, uh, shareholder meeting highlights. And you'll get little 10, 15, 20 minute clips of these guys talking about um, you know, the company, the economy, politics. People are asking questions like regular people just out there asking the greatest investors of all time. Um, you know, questions about diversification is a big topic for a lot of people. And the reason why that comes up a lot in Berkshire shareholder meetings is because Berkshire has about 20 companies in general in their portfolio, but about 75 to 80% of the weighting of their portfolio is in like five names. And if you go to school, like I did to study finance and investing and wealth management, the one thing that they preach is, you know, asset allocation is important, which it is. It explains 94% of the variability of results in your performance over any period of time you want to look at. Um, but it's also, they, they preach diversification. 
And what ends up happening is people over diversify themselves. And what Buffett and Munger famously said is that the death of performance is diversification. Like they, they flat out tell you decade upon decade of these shareholder meetings that there aren't any more than a handful or so companies that are worth investing in. Wow. And if those guys can identify more than like 15 to 20 companies to invest in, why the hell are we doing that? Like why, why are people out there buying mutual funds that have 500 plus positions? And by the way, it's not just one fund. They probably have like 17 funds right. in the portfolio. So you guys have basically bought the whole world. Yeah. <laughs> and you wonder why you consistently, you know, likely underperform something like the S&P 500. And then you go around and say, well, you know, these guys are a one-off handful. No, it's not true at all. I can go to Peter Lynch. I can go to a million other people that have understood this, is that controlling temperament is it's crucial. How to do that? Go look at what history has to say about similar events uh, that you see as what we call headline risk in the marketplace. And then you can look at, oh, there's actually 25 other times that this has happened, and here's what the forward returns were for all these different sectors of the S&P 500 over the next 6, 9, 12 months. And understanding that human beings are very valuable, they tend to repeat themselves over and over again. The probabilities are now in your favor, at least, right? There's no guarantee that past performance is going to give you some sort of future result for all the compliance people out there. That's, that's very obvious. But history is very important to look at from an investment standpoint, not just for your temperament, but to actually design an allocation to help you achieve a goal. And if the goal for a lot of my clients is to achieve growth, at least as good or better than the S&P 500, that gives us the opportunity to do that. And that's really what's led to a nearly 30% average return for our customers. Um, what a market. Ah, man, up. that's amazing. So, yeah. What I'm about to add to that too, and I expect to, to, that'll actually happen. I'm going to get to that here in just a little bit, but it's not because I'm some sort of, you know, super genius. Um, you know, I, I look at what these very smart individuals like Buffett and Munger have done. They give you the books. They give you all the YouTube information. That's the one thing that they didn't freaking have. They had books. Yeah. And they didn't have YouTube. They didn't have video evidence. You know, there's so much that we have as an advantage these days as individual investors um, that I don't think is appreciated enough on things like the news. So again, this is why we do this program. I really enjoy it. I hope you guys do as well. If you do, uh, please hit the uh, like button on YouTube. Hit the little notification bell that way when we post these things, you're, you're alerted. Um, and then share it with somebody. If you have questions, comments, things you want us to talk about in 2024 uh, or beyond, uh, please leave a comment there. We'd be happy to, to get to those questions and I will answer them directly. And of course, you can always hit me up directly with a question, uh, 513-630-2664. So the year of the hater is continuing. Um, let's get to some of the data here that came out today. So core PCE, this is the Fed's favorite measure of inflation. So core PCE uh, came out this morning, 8.30 in the morning. So October core PCE last month um, came in year over year at 3.5%, which is great because last month's September reading was 3.7%. So we're seeing this inflation continue to fall. Now on a month over month perspective, October core PCE consensus was expecting 0.2% month over month. It came in at 0.16% month over month. Last September, last month, uh, that number was 0.3% month over month. So continuing to decline year over year and month over month, which is awesome. That's exactly what we've been expecting. That's what we've been writing about all year long. That's what's led to interest rates falling across the yield curve and equity markets rising. Now, it's not always perfectly correlated like that, but in general, when you see interest rates coming down, the value of assets like stocks, specifically technology stocks, goes up. And the exact opposite happened last year in 2022. So interest rates went up the fastest that they've been in history of mankind from the Fed increasing uh, the Fed funds rate, uh, the fastest ever. And um, stock markets, specifically tech stocks, took it on the chin very, very hard. Um, and we're seeing the reverse of that this year. So it's not a one-for-one -one correlation, but it is great. One thing I wanted to point out here, I freaking hate this. And we talked about this before the show, as we talked about this in another podcast too. Yeah. Is that consensus was looking for 0.2, right? Month over month, like I just said. Well, the number came out 0.16, but what they talked about on the news, CNBC specifically, they rounded it up to 0.2. I freaking hate that. Like, you know, 
I don't know. You were a professor. I, I was. Mean, yeah. I'm sure you were right? Sometimes, maybe if you had a really hard exam and a bunch of people, I don't know, didn't do as well as it, you were hoping that they would have, you might oh, grade sure. on the curve. That's different, though, than this. This is like facts, data coming from the, dov- the government. And why can't it just be what it is? It's I mean, I can see just for packaging, you want to raise it up to like one or 0.175 instead of, you know, but 0.2 is almost a half a percent more. That's like so disingenuous. So when that came out, the, uh, <laughs> pre- mar- the pre-market, uh, so obviously the news is coming at 8.30, market doesn't open until 9.30. So I'm watching all this. I can see all the you know, major averages, NASDAQ, Dow, S&P, Russell. And then you can see all the yields, like the two years, five year, 10 year, 30 year. Um, yields were down prior to the news. Equities were way up pre-market. Information comes in exactly the way that you would want it to come in from my perspective. Um, you saw the employment numbers slightly increase a little bit, unemployment um, a little bit on the uh, jobless claims, but nothing to get uh, con- you know, excited about in a negative way. Um, it kind of came in line with expectations, but all the inflation numbers year over year, month over month, awesome readings. What happens? Interest rates go up, stocks go down. I'm sitting here right now about quarter past 11 Eastern time. The Dow's up about 88 or, or 0.89%, a little less than 1%. Um, but the S&P is basically flat and the NASDAQ is down close to half of 1% and interest rates across the yield curve have come up. Now, interest rates have been coming down dramatically. We were at like five, over 5% on the 10 year and now we're down to like 4.3. But oh, before nice. the year came out, we were like 4.25. So just because of that little nuance, Oh, well, met expectations. Interest rates came up, equities came down. Now, this is going to correct itself. I'm not concerned. I'm not changing positions for the asset allocation for our customers because of this rounding up information. This has happened in other um, uh, inflation uh, events when they come out before. Um, But I just wanted to point that out to everybody that is watching and will listen to this, is that they rounded the freaking number up. And actually came in below consensus expectations, which to me is noteworthy. And it should have actually continued the pre-market rally that we were expecting with this kind of information. So wanted to point that out there. And uh, hopefully you weren't too hard on your students when you were grading there. Uh, oh, no way, man. We had a little bit of a different grading system since it, you know, I was a professor of studio art. So, No doubt. Um, now... The core PCE is now, by the way, at the lowest level since April of 2021. Um, so that's, that's noteworthy as well. I don't, I don't know if that got enough, as a, enough attention as it should have got. So looking forward, so we got some data coming up in, in uh, December here. Specifically, December 12th, we get the current November CPI. Um, that'll come out at 8.30 in the morning. That's the first day of the Fed meeting. And the very next day at 8.30 in the morning, December 13th, we get the November EPI number at 8.30. The Fed is going to make an announcement on interest rate decision that same day on the 13th at 2 o'clock. And you'll get a uh, Fed Chair Powell speech at 2.30. Now, why is that important? One, we're going to get some more jobs data, get some inflation data um, before the next Fed meeting, which is great because the number that we got today was awesome. If we get another number like what we got here this month that actually happens on the 12th and the 13th, the, uh, the likelihood of the Fed increasing rates right now is 0% for December. Now the question is rate cuts. But before we get to the rate cut conversation, which is where I want to go next, All right. why do I think that CPI will continue to fall? Um, number one, OPEC Plus decided today that they're going to continue to reduce the production uh, goals by a million barrels per day. So likelihood of oil gasoline prices spiking very, very low, um, unless some sort of unforeseen event happened, which nobody's betting on or prepared for at the moment. So CPI, there's two huge components. One is used car inventory and used car prices. That's 17% of CPI. And housing, so specifically owner's equivalent rent, that's 42%. Of CPI, I mean those two numbers right there. That's damn near sixty percent of uh, the CPI, right? 
So used car inventory is way up. Used car prices are falling like a rock. So again, I expect CPI coming up out in uh, the 12th of December to be lower than consensus expects. They'll probably round that number up too. It might actually come out like 0.1 when everybody's expecting like 0.2. Then I'm just like, you know what? That's 1%. <laughs> I just want to throw that out there. And then the uh, housing stuff. Um, so yes, uh, I think housing pricing data has recently came out. It's been a little sticky, um, but that's the, the biggest lag effect as relates to CPI. And that's been coming down. Um, I don't expect that to change uh, either. So I do expect good readings from a CPI standpoint. Hopefully I don't round them up. Hopefully they're low enough uh, to where that cannot happen. But I am expecting good news on the inflation front. Which brings us to some recent uh, Fed speak here, and I want to get to a couple of things. So this is coming from Barron's, um, and this isn't Fed speak specifically, but we're getting some comments. Uh, this is from Andrew Hunter. He's the deputy chief U.S. economist at Research Group Capital Economics, wrote in a note, we continue to see a good chance that the Fed will begin cutting rates in March next year. So I'm going to pause right there. He's got a little bit more to say here. So first of all, uh, about a month ago when we did this podcast, the probability of a rate cut in March was like freaking zero. Um, there was a slight chance, or I'd say less than 50% chance, if I remember correctly, you have to go back and look at the podcast does, but I think in like June, people were counting on maybe a 45 to 50% chance of a rate cut then. But yeah. most people were expecting rate cuts like in the last two quarters of next year. And when we sat down with all of our customers, so by the way, Shepherd Wealth Management, we're not just here to give you performance. Um, I tell customers all the time, we'll give you the best performance we could possibly give you every single year, but people pay for our service. Um, not only do we prepare and file taxes for households of a half a million dollars or greater, uh, but we also will provide you know, estate planning credits up to $2,000 for households at a half million dollars or greater, um, that way they can get the uh, necessary estate planning needs done. And not only do we give you guys all the data from the podcast, the newsletters, the Friday blogs, I sit down, my business partner and I, John Ashcroft, the president of Shepherd Wealth Management, every single quarter, um, in person and all possible. Sometimes we have to do this via Zoom. Sometimes a phone call, people travel in the summertime and so forth. Um, but we sit down with everybody every single quarter. Maybe like, hey, as you told us that this was the goal, this is the growth that you were looking to achieve, this is why you want to achieve it because you're not going to retire for a while, yada, yada. Anything changed? No. Okay. We're either on pace, ahead of pace, or behind pace to achieve that goal. Here's what happened performance wise. And by the way, this year we've been ahead of pace, which is great. Congratulations. You made a great decision to hiring us from a performance standpoint. But here's what we need to look at from a historical standpoint based on this data. And here's how we're going to potentially tweak the asset allocation between now and our next meeting. And if you check out any of the stuff that we post out on shepherdwm.com, like I just mentioned, the podcast and these channels. Um, and we have these quarterly meetings, there's no way you're going to be surprised by the time we right. sit down. You have a good understanding as to why we feel the way that we feel, how you got the results that you got. All of it's powered by the asset allocation, by the way. And I just told you guys how we build the allocations based on historical precedents over things that we're going through right now. Now, I say all this to say this. In our last quarterly review, we were telling everybody the one thing that really wasn't priced in the market that we thought was probable is interest rate cuts happening sooner in the first half of the year than what a lot of people think. I was estimating around March, April timeframe, and it seemed to be like I was, I was fairly right um, about that. So what, what did we do? In preparation of this, um, I said, hey, you know, we're going to take some gains from tech, and we'll take some gains from energy, which we've had some this year, um, and we're going to take those dollars, we're going to allocate them to other parts of the portfolio that we don't have exposure to. We've been light on uh, small caps all year long. We've had almost hardly to no small cap exposure whatsoever this year. And the folks that did have it, we took it out of loss earlier this year because small caps were terrible. Um, but just in the last month, the Russell 2000, which is a small cap index, is up 9%, or, I'm sorry, 9% just in one month, um, which is phenomenal. The NASDAQ itself is up 10.7% uh, over the last month. So we've allocated those resources before all this data came out. And there may be a 5% weighting for an average portfolio here at Shepherd Wealth Management in small caps now. And that's been, that's been fantastic um, so far. And I expect that to continue. 
because if interest rate probability cuts are happening in March, now it's about 50% chance that happens. Well, guess what's highly correlated with interest rate cuts? Things like financials, things like small caps, things like industrials, and certainly technology, uh, that sector will benefit as well as interest rates continue to fall. This is how you not only build an allocation, but this is how you manage an asset allocation is by um, understanding that this is the headline information that everybody's going to get the information on. Everybody's got it. It's going to get sent to their phone, whether you want it or not. You know, the Huffington Post is going to notificate you um, that something's happening in the world and that you have to pay attention to it. Um, yeah, but this yeah. is how we go about designing an asset allocation and customizing it for individuals. Now, that was not something that people were talking about a month, two months ago. Everybody was saying rate cuts are either late 2024 or maybe not even until 2025. We thought it was probable that that might actually happen. Now, why is that? Because the Fed's got two freaking jobs. One is maximum employment. That box is checked. Unemployment rate's under 4%. I would define maximum employment as 4%. And really, anything unemployment rate between four and four and a half percent is fine, right? It's pretty much everybody that wants a job has a job, essentially. Um, and this economy can can handle that pretty well, even at a four and a half percent unemployment rate. I don't want that. I would think that most Fed people might want that because they're trying to get inflation to two percent like tomorrow. But yeah. the data yeah. that we're looking at here today is suggesting that we're likely going to get to two percent sometime in late 2024. So, if that is true, and I believe that it is, you're going into next year with full employment, and if inflation is going to get to 2% by the end of the year, close to it, why the hell would we want to leave interest rates at five and a half or five and a quarter to five and a half percent of Fed funds? You shouldn't, because it's way too restrictive on the economy that's still growing. It might not grow at 5% like it did in Q3, like we just got out of this year, um, but probably somewhere in that 2% range, which is very much historically average from a GDP perspective. Why keep the Fed funds rate so high when it definitely hurts those regional and small banks, as I mentioned, as interest rates come down, that's really good for, for finance sector as well, uh, specifically banks. And if they begin to cut rates, that's a huge tailwind to equity, specifically in an election year where everybody that's rerunning for office is going to get the, they're going to get to try to take credit for all this stuff, even though they probably really can't because they even, they haven't even started the, uh, the spending on uh, infrastructure. They've done some of the chip manufacturing spend. Like they're not even close to spending all these trillions of dollars, which is going to hurt the Fed from an inflation standpoint. But um, I don't, I don't actually think it's going to reverse inflation in a, in a tremendous way at all. Um, so with that being said, I think there's a lot of tailwinds coming into 2024. I'll have a lot more to say about my expectations for the S and P 500 and the markets in general as we get a little bit later into December. Um, I'll get my thoughts together and I'll present that to everybody. Um, before we get to January. And of course, we'll have a nice newsletter in January kind of laying out uh, expectations for 2024. But for all the bearish people that are out there, there are a lot of reasons to believe that we'll get interest rate cuts for the right reasons, not because the economy is falling off a cliff or growth is slowing too much too quickly. Um, therefore, the Fed has to cut interest rates to kind of stimulate the economy again. I think that we're actually pulling off this soft landing scenario. I've been saying that you know, for quite some time. And for all of those people, I feel so terrible for the $240 billion that has come out of equities this year. Um, I, I, I don't know what to tell you guys other than uh, maybe look in the mirror and have a hard conversation with yourself. Yeah, go out and get yeah. an ice cream and just be honest. You're know? going to have resolutions coming up anyway, right? Yeah. Maybe that resolution would be to fire yourself um, in the portfolio management. I'm going to fire was, myself and headline news. That's what we're doing. That's what we might need to do. But I do want to get back to some of these comments, though, because I think they're important. Um, so getting back to Andrew Hunter here. So he sees the Fed cutting rates in March next year, a little sooner than markets expect, as I just mentioned. And he goes on to say, with a growing body of evidence that inflation will be close to 2% target by mid-2024, I think it might be later in 2024. So this guy's got a bit more of a bullish stance than I do. Uh, he goes on to say, we also think markets still haven't gone far enough in pricing in rate cuts over the next 18 months. Dude, as I don't know how we can get this information to a place like CNBC faster, but I feel like these guys are behind the eight ball a little bit. Yeah. Um, 
compared to what we've been saying for, for quite some time now. Now, the article goes on to say PCE inflation readings are always important to investors and the Fed, but the timing of this release makes it particularly important, this being the last month or the last day of November. Uh, this is the last PCE print as well as the last major inflation indicator before the Fed's next two-day monetary policy meeting beginning on December 12th. Readings of CPI and PPI, December 12th and 13th, respectively, as we've already covered. So, again, I think the Fed on the 13th is the day that we're tremendously going to see a significant difference in tone. Um, going from, oh, we're going to be higher for longer. That, that thing is so done and dead. I'm so sick of hearing that freaking phrase of higher for longer. For sure. um, we've done that already this year. You've already been higher for longer. Um, and all the data points are telling you that now it's time to reconsider that. And I think that they have nothing um, that they could possibly hold on to to keep that mantra going. Now, if they do that, they're, they're really putting themselves in a very tight you know, situation here where they were way late to the game on raising interest rates, right? So then they had to raise them as fast as we've ever raised them in the history of mankind. Do they really want to go into next year? with egg on their face again saying, oh man, we were, we were way too tight for way too long. Now we got to rein this back in. Right. I don't, I don't see that happening. So I think you're going to see a significant tone uh, from the Fed. And the reason why I think that is because you had some Fed speak here over the last couple of days. So this is coming from Reuters. Uh -huh. And the uh, title of this article is, with Fed likely done hiking rates, uh, Fed Chair Waller flags pivot ahead. And here's what he had to say. Um, quote, I am increasingly confident that policy is currently well positioned to slow the economy and get inflation back to 2%. Also, reasonably confident of doing so without a sharp rise in the unemployment rate now at 3.9. So he's basically saying this is the soft landing. He goes on to say, if the decline in inflation continues for several more months, three months, four months, five months, we can start lowering the policy rate just because inflation is lower goes on to say, it has nothing to do with trying to save the economy. It is consistent with every policy rule. There is no reason to say we will keep it really high. Cough and nails is what I hear there on inflation. Um, we have this thing under control. And now you're, by the way, Fed Chair Waller is probably one of the most hawkish people that has a vote on the Fed, uh, Fed Chair board itself. Like yeah. he's been pounding the table higher for longer. We need to take it. I think this guy was at one point thinking about taking, I think he's quoted actually, I should probably go find that. Um, he's quoted as saying, we probably need to take policy to like 6%. I was going to say, is he a 7 percenter? Is he one of them? <laughs> he's definitely in that, he was in that camp. Yeah. Now that his tone has changed, um, you did see interest rates take note of that. So the last couple of days, interest rates were coming down. Um, based on the news that we got today, again, this is what puzzles me. And this is what makes me kind of furious that they rounded that core PCE number up month over month. Um, but you saw interest rates come up. It could be profit taking, you know, in the fixed income world. Um, we, we, we are talking about doing that here for our customers at Shepherd Wolf Management. I mentioned one of the ways that we're playing this interest rate fall is not just with equity positioning in the sectors that we've been in all year long, tech heavy, industrials heavy, energy kind of equal weight, S&P almost no exposure to all the other nine sectors of the S&P 500. Um, but we did add this uh, ETF, PLT is the ticker symbol. It's a um, iShares ETF for the 20-year um, uh, treasury. And the reason why we own it is not because we want additional bond exposure, it's because we expect interest rates to fall, which they have. By the way, that TLT is up 9.9% month over month. So we're very excited about that trade for our customers. Um, we were right about that, and um, we're likely going to exit the position only because I don't know of interest rates on the curve until we get rate cuts um, or until maybe on the 13th, the Fed might say, yeah, we're, we're definitely done, and now it's just a question of when we're going to start cutting rates. I don't think that they'll say that. It would be nice if they were that honest with the American public, um, but I'm not counting on that. They probably always want to give themselves an out, which to me is stupid. Um, because they always have the option to change their mind whenever they want to. And they can just point to data. Like they don't have to be like, oh, this is my opinion. It's like, oh, well, we thought this and this is what happened. So now we have to change the direction that we thought we were going to go. And by the way, that's what most other Fed people do at other countries. 
right? They, they do it all the time. Um, that's not what happens in the United States. We have to lay it all out for individual investors like three months in advance. Otherwise, people just lose their freaking mind, which is unfortunate. Now, I do want to get to a couple other things here. Um, as we talked about, the 10 years been following the VIX, by the way, is a volatility index. Yeah, we haven't um, talked about old VIX here in a while. Uh, the VIX less than 14%. Uh, which is phenomenal. I think the, the average VIX is usually somewhere around the 17 yeah. uh, number. And then I think in 2022, the VIX was uh, averaging north of 20. Um, and for those of you that aren't familiar with the VIX, it's just a volatility index. You can look at it as like a fear uh, or greed index. So the lower the VIX, generally the better the market, the higher the VIX, generally the more fearful everybody is. And uh, with the S&P 500 back to 1985 to present, when the VIX is below 14%, generally speaking, the market is like a, a hockey stick, kind of up and to the right. So for the remainder of this year, for a lot of reasons that we just laid out on the inflation front, the VIX being extremely soft, interest rates coming down, and very much expecting a Santa Claus rally. Um, and I think that really kicks off on the 13th um, when the Fed actually acknowledges the fact that they probably very most likely will never be increasing interest rates in this hiking cycle um, going forward. So it would be amazing if some of Waller's candidness came out and they actually admitted something like that. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it, it has to come from Chair Powell, though. Right. right. Yeah. I mean, everybody else is just kind of a, they don't have a final say. It's not as authoritative as if it comes from Powell. Right. So we got to hear it from Jerome himself. And um, me and Jerome have not seen eye to eye for, uh, I don't know, what do you think, Ez, about a year and a half? Yeah. Uh, I'd say pushing on a couple dozen months here, so about two years. <laughs> well, the, the, the sad news is he is still not returning my phone calls. Mm. Um, I really wanted to prepare most of his uh, comments um, because the problem is is when he, uh, he has his you know, pre-recorded, if you will, pre-written comments that somebody wrote for him. And they're generally very good. Market likes it. But then when he has to answer questions off the cuff, not so quick on his feet, if you will, he's uh, always dancing around the, because he doesn't want to give like this big green flag, like, hey, the race is on in the stock market. He doesn't want to see that when he's trying to fight inflation. So I kind of understand it. But um, when you talk about credibility, that's not how you get it from me. Um, you get it by just being upfront, honest, and direct, just like Charlie Munger would be if uh, he was the Fed chair. Yeah. He would say, yeah, we're doing this because it's the right thing to do. And until otherwise noted with data, we are going to continue to do this. And then when the data tells us otherwise, I'm not going to be wishy-washy about it. Like, hey, man, this is, this is great stuff. We're actually getting what we want, inflation coming down without destroying jobs. Like, that's the goal. It's a very difficult thing to do. Um, so you got to give them some credit for that. But the, uh, the reality is, is uh, if you want some credibility, um, you know, you need to you know, man up when you're wrong. And they kind of did that when they kept calling inflation transitory. Uh, but they, they, they wanted to triple down on that for too long. And then they had to eventually say, well, yeah, um, price is about 9% higher than what they should be. So maybe it wasn't so transitory. I think now though, if you actually look at it from a longer view, which investors should, you know, short periods of time, it's very difficult to determine what will happen in the market. Um, but you can kind of look at it now and say, maybe it really was transitory because now that all the supply chains and all the stuff around the globe are, are functioning the way that it was pre-pandemic, um, it very well um, could have been transitory, which means that the Fed probably is too high right now. Because I believe that they are, in fact, going to have to cut rates sooner in the year and what a lot of people are expecting just simply because the inflation numbers will likely continue to fall in the manner that they have for the last several months. And we'll get uh, one more really good piece of evidence of that um, in the next couple of weeks. Let me ask you something. What are, the, what are the chances that maybe it was both? Maybe it was, let's just say the majority of transitory, but then there was this influx of maybe some kind of I, you know, for lack of a better term, like corporate greed that kind of saw an opportunity to maybe hike prices more than they should have. And we had a combination of the two. I think, I think you're right. Um, I, think it's, I think it's never one thing, but I do think you're right. Because the truth is, if you can pass along higher costs, 
as a company? Why wouldn't you? You have to. Yeah. Right. Margin. Right. That's that's the bottom line uh, for corporate America. I mean, that's just the way that it's always been. I mean, uh, there's a reason why bread doesn't cost a nickel anymore. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. I mean, I wish it weren't that way, but it it does feel like that there was a. Not only were we at the mercy of the supply chain issues from the pandemic, you know, the massive globalization shutting down, but that there was a capitalization on fear and a further increasing that maybe didn't need to happen and didn't need to strap everybody so much. And maybe we wouldn't be in this total situation we are, but I think it's, it's kind of silly to separate the two to me, you know, but I, I'm not the expert. So, yeah, I mean, the, the three things, if I had to put my finger on it, food prices, car prices, and, um, uh, housing. Um, you can say energy too, but truth the truth of the matter is whatever happens with monetary policy or even for that matter, fiscal policy has almost no effect on the price of energy. So we'll just kind of keep it off the side. Um, but food, uh, cars and, uh, homes, home costs. Those are the three things that kept inflation high. Now those things are falling. You've yeah. seen that Costco, like take a look at Costco's CEO, earnings calls, any articles recently on Costco's announcements. The prices are coming down, right? I, I mean, I, I can see that for sure. Not everything has hit the floor it was before it jacked up, but it's if it's either there or very close to back down. Yeah, avo avocados, you can get guac now back at Chipotle without paying five bucks for a scoop of guac. <laughs> I can get eggs that are under three bucks a dozen. Yeah, so here we are. Um, inflation's falling, which is great. Now, the other thing that keeps me very bullish too is we just got, we're, we're pretty much done with earnings season. We've got a few companies yet. Um, but 486 companies have reported. That's 97% of the S&P 500. 83% of those companies beat expectations and they beat by a median of 7%. I mean, these are just really good, really, really good stuff here. So, I mean, I don't know how bears are still making a case. Fear, man. Even, no, no. <laughs> That's what makes the market though, right? Because if everybody's on one side of the boat, just like this year, everybody was on the bearish camp recession. That was a huge opportunity for us yeah. at Shepherd Wealth Management for our clients. And we, we are ringing you know, the victory bell kind of right now. And we will continue to ring that bell for the rest of this year. Again, I'll get to next year in a couple more weeks. Um, I'll give my thoughts on that for sure. But um, it presents opportunity. Now, if everybody gets on the, hey, man, this is going to be a party, then that's where you got to take the Words of wisdom from Warren Buffett is I got to start being fearful when others are greedy. Yep. I got to be greedy when others are fearful. And right now I'm going to sustain that, uh, that positioning that we have, which is very much bullish. Um, and we've been right about that all year long. Well, it's yeah, you got to keep up the, the congratulatory rhetoric too, because it's a good counter to all the <laughs> sky is falling. Not this isn't really true fear mongering that we see in the headline news. And you know, somebody's got to be telling it how it is, you know? That's right. That's right. Um, and then the other thing that, I, that caught my eye this morning is that there's a uh, Barron's, uh, what they call big money poll. And uh, pros are split. So these are pro investors, big institutional investors. Pros are split on the outlook for stocks, but they are fans of bonds. And this is, this is killing me, man. If interest rates are coming down, the only way that you're going to make money on bonds is if you buy a longer duration. And in this article, they don't want to go long duration. They're sticking on the short end of the curve. If they cut rates, that's exactly the first thing that's going to get whacked. And uh, by the way, those things are going to mature much sooner than something like a 10 year. So you're not going to make all that money um, that you were hoping to, which by the way, as we mentioned, as interest rates come down, that's generally a tailwind for equities. And if you were in treasuries all year long, clipping your 5% coupons, like I mentioned, that's a 15% opportunity cost. And if you're a Shepherd Wealth Management comparison, that's a 25% opportunity cost for an average client here of ours. Um, so here's what this survey found of these, quote, pro investors. And by the way, all the pro investors were wrong this year too. So you can definitely take this with a massive block of salt, all right? Um, so 46% of respondents expected the economy to enter a recession in the next 12 months. That sounds familiar. Um, <laughs> but if it... Uh, need it be a crisis level downturn? Just six percent of investors expect U.S. real gross domestic pro uh, product to contract by two percent or more next year. They go on to say, "quote It's really hard to generate a big uh, recession when there's that much money flowing into the economy." 
Forget that. I mean, yes, that's true. There is a lot of money flowing into the economy. And like I said, we haven't even really spent this infrastructure money that we're planning on spending. If 70% of the U.S. economy is consumers, as long as consumers have a job, they will consume. Right. I mean, you have to. This is the reason why they couldn't call an official recession in 2022 when, by the way, all the boxes were checked from a textbook definition. You had uh, two consecutive quarters of negative GDP. You had the S&P 500 down 20%. I mean, that's check mark, check box for recession. Don't the yield curve. Yeah, you had inverted yield curve. And um, the only reason why you did not get the official government stamp of recession is because the unemployment rate was less than 4%. It was like at 3.5%, 3.6%, all in 2022. So with that being said, yes, there's money flowing in to this uh, economy from a lot of different places, but the biggest one being, if jobs are plentiful, the consumer will consume. And that means there will not be a recession. So it's just a question of how much the S&P 500 is going to be positive, in my view, um, for 2024. And again, I'll give my outlook for that coming up here in the next few weeks. But this, this continues to catch my eye. I, it truly is fascinating. Like It's like behavioral finance is just literally playing out. Human beings feel losses twice as much as they feel good about making money. And I think humans feel like they're smarter when they're betting against the house, the house being the market. And by the way, when you wake up every January 1st, there's about a 70% chance you're going to have more money just by participating in the market than you did um, you know, at the end of the year than you did at the beginning of the year. But I think human beings are just uh, hardwired, feeling losses twice as much as they feel good about making money. So it just means we're risk averse by nature. We want to preserve and protect ourselves from, from dangerous things, losing money being dangerous in the eyes of most people. But for almost two years now, people have been so bearish. Um, I don't know what changes their mind because when things are, quote, comfortable, it's rarely profitable. When everybody else is like, oh, yeah, great time to be 100% invested in the market, it's probably not going to last all that long when everybody's like, yeah, we should join this party. Right. So when everybody else joins, I'm going to consider getting out. Um, and I encourage you to kind of consider the same thing. Now, before we wrap up, I did want to get to uh, Charlie Munger. Um, as I mentioned, just passed away, 99 years old. Um, CEO Warren Buffett for more than 50 years. I worked right alongside him. Um, says Munger died peacefully Tuesday morning, California hospital. And here's what Buffett had to say, you know, when he was asked uh, about Charlie Munger right after his death. Well, Berkshire Hathaway could not have been built to its present status without Charlie's inspiration, wisdom, and participation. And um, I did want to give another um quick little minute here. So Buffett also was quoted by saying, uh, Charlie has the best 30 second mind in the world. He goes from A to Z in one move. He sees the essence of everything before you can even finish a sentence. I think that that's a great quote. Um, obviously a hundred percent accurate. The guy was just a machine from a you know, diagnosing a situation and coming to a conclusion standpoint, which is a great trait, obviously for anybody in a, uh, a capitalist type of position that he was. Um, but he was a, uh, he was kind of a hater too in a lot of things as like, he hates Robin hood. <laughs> um, he oh, called it a gambler. <laughs> he called it a gambling parlor, um, hiding as a respectable business. Yeah. Um, he called Bitcoin, you know, disgusting. Yeah, um, we're different on that one. <laughs> he was funny. I, well, if you're going to sell the idea of Bitcoin, you probably don't want to sell that to a 90, 99 year old. Um, yeah. Of that. And Buffett knew, uh, quote, he knew instantly Charlie was a, a kind of guy that he was going to like, and I was going to learn from him. Uh, but you knew it wasn't anything calculated, decision or anything like that. It was natural. We've had nothing but fun. We've had, uh, we've never had an argument for 62 years, Buffett said. We literally in 62 years, we've never gotten mad at each other. Wow. Which, which is hard to believe. But also when you're having that level of success, doing something that you know for sure that you were put on this earth to do, I can see how you can go 62 years with never really having a uh, uh, major argument or blow up with your, your business partner. I kind of feel like that right now. Now, it's only been... So Shepherd Wealth Management's been in business for two and a half years now at the end of this December. 
um, coming up. And we're, we're quite proud of what we've been able to accomplish starting from nothing. Uh, created this company at the end of uh, uh, one year. Uh, we were at a little over 30 million in assets under management. Today, we're, we're sitting right at about 75 million in assets under management. So uh, John Ashcroft, our president, joining the company in January of this year was a huge part of that. Uh, growth. And I kind of feel the same way. I met John naturally at TD Ameritrade. First person I met. Uh, I didn't even have a boss at the time. I mean, I had a regional boss, but I didn't have a, a branch in the office. As we know, Raj was the ultimate hire there. Um, Raj has been on the show. Uh, love Raj. But John was actually the very first person, not even a TD Ameritrade employee. He uh, was a TD Ameritrade employee. Uh, ended up working for a company that at, uh, at the time we used to refer business to um, at least in some instances for customers. And we just hit it off naturally. It was great. Been great friends ever since then. As you know, as you were, um, you know, one, one of the, uh, uh, guys in our wedding, John was there as well. Yeah. That's uh, when I met John. Yeah. Part of the wedding party. And, um, you know, now we're in business together and, um, I, I can say this has been not only the fastest year of my life, but one of the most fun years of my life, not just from a business standpoint, but just all around. When you're doing something that you know for sure that you'll put on the surf with you, you love it that much, and you get to do it alongside of somebody you really like and get along with, trust and respect. I mean, it's it's it's, it's awesome. Now, I don't know if we're going to have the same sort of success or as much fun as Warren and Charlie did. I yeah. like to think so. But this is also something I want to encourage everybody that watches and listens to this program. I know we talked about it before, but um, we all have specific skills, talents, and abilities. If you focus on that, I think you'll, you'll ultimately find a lot of happiness and joy. And then all the other stuff that you have to be responsible for in life, money, you know, your state, your whatever is important to you outside of your purpose, your, your doing this uh, here on this earth, find other people that you can surround yourself with that are similar minded, but have those skills and resources that you can benefit from. Because the truth is, I think if you focus on what you really are put on this planet to do, not only will you have more fun, you'll likely make more money, um, and you'll just simply enjoy your time on this earth so much more um, than you would otherwise. So that's a huge encouragement. I take that lesson from Warren Buffett and Charlie themselves. I'm actually a real life experience of that so far. And, uh, you know, I, I, I certainly hope nothing um, but the best for Berkshire in the future. Uh, but I also hope nothing but for the best for people that are listening to this and trying to apply some of the stuff that we talk about the the daily life. So um, that's everything that we wanted to get to as on uh, the list here. I know that we're running up on our time here for the show. Any uh, questions or anything else we need to make sure the listeners and viewers are uh, aware of here? No, no. I think everybody's excited for the new format. I want to remind everybody that, you know, things are going to change, you know, till we kind of settle on what we prefer. Uh, But we're going to continue this remote stream probably indefinitely, I think. Yeah, I love it. Um, so appreciate everybody watching, listening. Uh, we'll do this again every two weeks. Um, I'll be writing a newsletter tomorrow and posting that uh, on the website so you guys can check that out. Uh, I'm not going to give you any uh, hints at what it'll be, but um, it'll be a good newsletter. And uh, don't forget, check us out, shepherdwm.com. All the resources are there right at the top of the page. YouTube, Spotify, newsletters, blogs, everything you need to know about the company and myself. It's been a great pleasure. I look forward to doing this again in a couple weeks. And I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Take care. 